Well, good morning, everyone. I do believe we are on the downhill slide of another wonderful summer here in Phoenix, Arizona. I am Dave Riccio, here along with Matt Allen. And this is Bumper to Bumper Radio, heard here every Saturday from 11 to noon. We are here to help you with car questions and car concerns. The motoring public, we want you to have a better overall car experience. If you've got car questions, we've got answers, and we encourage you to give us a call at 602-277-5827. Today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, let's see if this uh, spawns any questions for you, because maybe you're living with a gremlin in your car. We're going to do a little bit of fact or fiction, bringing that thing back from the grave. Uh, Open phones, and he mentioned gremlins or ghosts or... I don't know. Possessed. Possessed vehicles. And we do have uh, Ouija boards and that type of stuff in the shops <laughs> to figure out these cars that have intermittent issues. These intermittent issues are frustrating not only to you, the consumer, but as auto shops, you know, people, they say, hey, my, my car stalled yesterday. Can you check it out, figure out what's going on? We plug into a scanner. Nothing. No codes, no errors, no messages. And uh, we drive the car, and it runs great. Air conditioning blows nice and cold, and, ma'am. Is there something wrong with you? Because your car works just <laughs> fine. And you as a consumer like, I promise it really stalled on me. It, really, I'm not crazy. Are you sure you're not crazy? But no, it does It does happen. Everyone's worried about it. As soon as, when they have one of those issues, as soon as I take it to the shop, I know it's not going to do it for them. And they're going to tell me to bring it back when it gets worse. Something like that. And I've heard technicians say that. And sometimes that's the right advice. Well, I think sometimes the customers know it, Dave, because they're like, oh, well, it's doing this. Well, But, of course, it didn't do it this morning. So there is a there is a level there where they understand that this it's the Murphy's Law kind of thing. It, it's it's not. You, you know, always say when you go to the doctor, you're not going to feel sick. And your car knows it's there and knows we got a big old needle we're going to stick it with. And uh, it's going to totally behave itself. But yet there is a problem going on. How in the heck do you address that and not be looking crazy when you go to the shop? What are some thoughts? Well, I don't know, Dave. I mean, there, there, good documentation of what what's going on. I mean, there, there's uh, drivability worksheets or, or worksheets that we have where we can ask you questions. When does it do it? When doesn't it do it? What's happening? What were you doing when when this? problem happened but you can have it in all different sorts of areas running problem air conditioning problems transmission problems all the time of course uh uh brake you know noises the brakes squeak sometimes and sometimes they don't and the biggest thing that i think is to have an understanding when you're working with your shop is we want to fix the car oh it's in our best interest to fix it but we don't want to try to fix something that's not happening and people will get frustrated and say well, what are you going to do or what are you going to fix or I, am I crazy or whatever? But we don't want to just come up with something. But on the other hand, we don't just make something up. Oh, um, yeah, we'll just do that because that seems, you know, it's, just, it's Tuesday, so we're going to make this repair. When we do make a a repair, it's because of information or data that we gather. And sometimes there's other problems that can you know this problem can cause what you're having cause your symptom i guess we have symptom and problem once in a Um, while we guess on problems when we have sometimes the diagnosis is worse than the cure and i'll just give an example but let's just take a car that has known uh, crank angle sensor issues okay well we drive it and we drive it nothing happens nothing happens it only happens to you the third sunday of every fifth month i don't know whatever and uh, we're not going to get that to happen. Well, we can take an educated guess with a $200 part in labor and installation, or we can suffer through this ongoing stalling issue. You know, that sometimes that's a that's a solution. And you can, but if you have a mechanic take a guess, you guys got to decide who's who's responsible if it doesn't work out. And sometimes we tell the customer, hey, we can take this guess. It's a $200 gamble, and it's absolutely on you. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And this that's not any that's not a guess of just pulling a pulling a you know a bunch of numbers out of that's a an hat educated guess it's based on maybe it's based on the history of the of that car that particular model these Nissans always have this problem you're right in the mileage range you've never had this repair done we fixed four of them this year so far just like this uh, you know the parts and labor to put these parts in are are two hundred dollars but we might spend I don't want to spend two hundred dollars telling you you have a two hundred dollar problem either so sometimes it absolutely makes sense 
to make a guess. But you're right. We have to. That has to all be Try discussed something. up front. Well, the intermittent stalling issue. Uh, you know, we used. To, I used to hear people say, "Well, it's either fuel or spark." You know, it's one or the other, fuel or spark. It, you know, that worked in 1985 and maybe even 1995. But it's not just fuel or spark anymore. You know, it's fuel, spark, and it's air. But we got a whole bunch of, uh, you know, sensors that make fuel and spark happen. So I'll use the example of the crank sensor. How much fuel and air and spark is there, too? You can have a little bit of all those, and the darn thing still won't run. Well, you know, you can, you know, you can plug in a fuel pressure gauge and tape it to the windshield and go drive it, and and the fuel pressure may go away when it stalls. Okay. So what? Oh, it's a fuel problem. No, it's not a fuel problem. That fuel pump is not working because the crank angle sensor is bad. So it's not simple, and we can we can uh, be reductionist and make auto repair seem simple. But in the modern car, there's so much more complication to it that you know when we got an intermittent issue, something's going offline. We just don't know what. Well, and it's not was, happening long enough for us to 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 see it. Yeah, when I was learning and training, it was you break it down. You put a check for spark. You check the fuel pressure and get an annoyed light. If you didn't have an injector pulse. You went to the computer, you were checking for power and ground. If you didn't have fuel pressure, you went right to the fuel pump. But now the system is much more complicated, like you said. So if you don't have a crank angle sensor working, the computer is not even going to try to turn on the fuel pump, nor is it going to give it any spark. So it's not still not going to run. You can have neither one of those things. Well, intermittent issues are super frustrating for consumers. They're super frustrating for shops. But, you know, there's some shops that don't mind the challenge as long as they have a reasonable customer who understands that it's an intermittent issue. Um, you know, I understand there's a car at your shop right now that you can't fix. <laughs> we, <laughs> you didn't know that was Dave, coming. <laughs> Dave, we have a couple this this month that, uh, you know, I thought August was going to get off to a good start. But, we we and it's not even an intermittent problem. We have a car with a check engine light. It's been to two other shops. We've had it. We've made some repairs. We we, we made logical step repairs to this car. Fixed some things that were bad. Improved the running condition. This car runs perfect, but the check engine light comes on. We or nobody else can figure it out, and that's not even intermittent. It it's mm. it's just crazy, but. The other thing, too, that happens where people have to understand is if I, on, on one of these cases, I was in, accused of being too technical. And I wasn't trying to explain how the car was running. I think what the person maybe was trying to say is, is bringing it down to semantics. Oh, you, you're uh, tomato, tomato. No, it's not tomato or tomato. The car stalling every time or the car stalling after you drove it. In this car, for example, we drove it 32 miles. It stalled once after sitting still at the stoplight for 45 seconds. Oh, yeah, that's what it does. That's not what you said. <laughs> that's not what you, you said. Know, besides the fact the car barely ran, it was shaking, it had a you know flashing check engine light, all these problems. Get the car running good, and then it leaves and comes back with a stalling problem. Every 40 miles. Once in a while, yeah, while sitting at the light. Well, it's, so it stalls. What's the difference? That you're just being te- you're trying to get a technicality now. Yeah, no, but it's it's it's, it's we've like, got to gather this data: hot, cold, uh, air conditioning on. Go ahead, Dave. What are the other ones? What are well, you? I got I got a, a uh, I guess it's a Ferrari. It's called a La Forza. <laughs> it's a it's a unique car. If you haven't seen one lately, most people haven't. But I do have one at my shop that has an intermittent issue. Or Explorer. Ford Explorer on it with a Ferrari body on it, right? <laughs> and I drove this guy's car 200 miles, and the issue never happened. And he's like, man, I promise you, Dave, it's acting up. I know you think I'm crazy. No, I don't think you're crazy. I just know your car's not going to misbehave for me. So what I finally did uh, was I came up with a worksheet, and I wanted to know what was the temperature outside when it happened, what was the vehicle operating temperature, two different things. And they seem like small details, what mile per hour were you going when this happened? And then what was the engine RPM when this happened? And there was about six key things, and I gave him three worksheets, each with three of these little forms, event detail. And I just had him document each time it happened what it looked like. And he's not done yet. He's halfway through. But I'm going to look at all you know all 12 events and see what happens. So if this is spawning anything for you, say, I have an intermittent issue, and I'm just living with it, but I would love to get it fixed and you want some help with that? 602-277-5827. 602-277-KTAR. And we promise when you go to the doctor, your car is going to feel sick. Anyway, you're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. This is Bumper to Bumper. News Talk 92.3 KTAR. 
All righty, so we're talking about intermittent problems with your car today. So maybe you have one of these cars out there that needs a, what is it, to be exercised or to have... <laughs> exorcist. It's, it's an exorcist, but getting the getting that thing out of there, I forget what the heck a it gremlin. is. A gremlin. Yeah, it's not a gremlin, but we need some holy water on it. Maybe we need to go to... Bless it, you know. <laughs> Do something. But if you want some ideas or have any other car questions, Dave and I are here every Saturday to help you with your car. And if you if you have a question about your car, whether it's an intermittent problem or just, just anything you want to talk about with your car, 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. So intermittent problems are, are kind of the topic today. Uh, Everyone hates intermittent problems. Well, I guess if it's really a problem, just trade the car off and make it somebody else's problem. <laughs> well, yeah, and then we talk <laughs> about the used car inspection. So the next thing will happen is, well, oh, yeah, this used car is great. looks good. Well, you just got this problem. <laughs> Can you imagine that one? It's, uh, yes. E- either way, you are you could be doomed. So if you hear your car whispering, get out, <laughs> maybe, that's, maybe that's when you do that. That's a sign. Well, up first this segment, we've got Sebastian in Avondale. Looks like he's got a 2005 Nissan Altima. Go ahead, Sebastian. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, thanks for taking my call. Um, I'm having an issue where the car will, it, it, it will not, uh, it will not start um, after, you know, parking after a while, and you come back, go to the store or whatever. But it always seems to happen during the summer. I don't know if this is related to the battery or I don't know anything about cars. That's why I'm calling you guys. Okay. So first thing you said, it happens more in the summertime. But now we'll, here's where we get into the questions at the shop at the counter. You're in Virginia Auto Service, and I'm going to ask you. So you say it doesn't start. Now I'll say – do you you turn the key and nothing happens, or you turn the key and it starts, or or it wants to start like a you're, car that's out of gas? Right, you're right. That was kind of broad what I said. So as as I I need to like start it, so then it'll begin. I turn the key and then it'll begin to try to start, and then after maybe four seconds I'll stop, and then I'll turn it, and then it usually starts up right away. Okay, so that's what so, we would call a crank. Yeah, kind of our slang would be shop lingo would be crank, crank no, no start, start. but <laughs> but but then it cranks it cranks over no 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 it doesn't right. start you stop turning the key, you turn the key back off go to start it again cranks up and fires right up usually right right Dave That's you're fine. looking at me <laughs> but, well uh, okay. first of all I'm thinking of uh, I'm thinking we've got a great Nissan guy and any any of the shops really at bumper to bumper radio could handle a problem like this but Joel Bartko Arizona import specialist in Tempe is fantastic with Nissan and he's probably going to text me here in a minute and tell me what's wrong with the car he always does but to me it sounds like maybe a fuel issue you know and it's it's related to heat I know electronics like to mess up when the car is hot you know, you have an electronic that will test normal when the car's cool, but after you've, you know, the car's been heated up and then sat in the hot parking lot where you're in fries, you know, when you come back, it, it didn't want to start up. That could be an issue, but then I'm starting to think since it does start up, we we call that a hot soak. If you get a car that's a, a 2005, a lot of carbon buildup in the engine. There's carbon buildup on the backside of the valves. The fuel injectors are a little bit dirty. Maybe the fuel pump is on the margin there. You get an extended cranking time. And a lot of times you have a maintenance issue. You have you have to need to have fuel injection system cleaning and engine decarbon, and you fix problems with that kind of thing, with those kind of services at times. They're meant as preventative issues, but you get a uh, that's an eight year old car, probably has one hundred and twenty five or thirty thousand miles on it. You could have a carbon issue that's just causing a symptom, and maybe you don't have a bad fuel pump or a bad fuel pump really. But you're right, Dave. The heat will affect electronics differently than let's just say this was January. It's going to be different. Well, and the and part of the topic here today with the intermittent issue is that if you took that to the shop and you told them I have a starting issue, they'd say, "Okay, great. We'll get that checked out for you." And they're going to ask you crank no start whatever. And they may not dig in deep enough, but if they pull in the bay and the car starts right up, they can say, "Hey, man, everything's working great." But where, where you need to communicate to the shop is, listen, hey, if I drive the car for 15 minutes to the grocery store, I get out, I go inside, I buy my bacon and eggs, come back out, the car won't start. 
Well, that's what they need to know. After a, after a long drive and then sit and letting the car sit for 10, 15 minutes on a parking lot, that is when it's happening. That's what they're going to have to do to duplicate the issue, to see what's going on. So it would be, not be unreasonable to let the shop, this is one of the things we talk about where it being frustrating, maybe the shop has to have the car for two days. You need to take it overnight. Maybe somebody needs to drive it home with them. Those are things that we do to try to duplicate and replicate these problems. But then after we have it happen to us, if we don't have equipment hooked up to it, now what? Or But, Dave, what about you go in, you bring that car in the shop. It we're, In my shop, now I'm not working on cars every day, but I'm participating actively in the shop every day. Car comes in. We know it, it's a it's a that extended cranking time or that have to turn the key the second time. So we're going to do a battery test. We're going to do a charging system test. If I was the technician, I'd probably put a fuel pressure test on it. I'm going to pull the spark plugs out. Now we see spark plugs that are just completely worn out. Now what? Right. Do we have to have known good components sometimes. before we continue testing? Sometimes. sometimes. And that's the hard part about maintenance. When the car is neglected on maintenance, sometimes we've got to catch the maintenance up just to even see what's going on. So looks like today's Nissan day. We're going to go with Steve in Glendale on a 1997 Nissan pickup. Go ahead, Steve. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you for taking my call, Matt and Dave. You bet. I have a 1997 Nissan pickup. It's got a, almost a quarter of a million miles on it. And uh, this year has been the year of repairs and upcoming repairs. I was told i got to look at replacing the timing chain, uh, doing the valves, and it's got a leak around the oil pan gasket. Um, given the mileage that it has on the engine, I've been looking into doing a replacement or a rebuild for the engine instead of doing all the little repairs, just putting a new engine in there. I wanted to know what your opinion is of these rebuilds because I'm hearing some bad news that they're unreliable, that I'll have more problems with the rebuild as if, instead of just repairing the engine. Well, uh, you know, I did definitely have some, you know, I related to the transmission business, you know, for sure, is there's, you know, where is rebuilt set up as a standard by the federal government? It's not. Rebuilt means so many different things to so many different people. One guy's rebuilt, I wouldn't put in my enemy's car. You know, it's not, it's not a good one. And the next guy that rebuilds it, it's actually better than it was new. So there's a huge you know, discrep- You know, there's just a big variation in the quality of a rebuild. I think at 250,000 miles, do we go in and do a valve job and fix an oil pan gasket and a timing chain and all that stuff? I don't know if I'm a fan of that either. I think it is It is a point where the engine's probably tired out and it is, is time to either, you know, I favor actually rebuilding the engine that's out of the car. Well, yeah, the, the problem, and I don't know if part of the, I don't think part of the question was, is it wise to do this repair if you love the car and, and, yeah, and you want to fix it, you're going to spend a few thousand dollars on it probably to do an engine. But you don't want to go to the guy that replace, that advertises engines in the back of the TV guide or on the back of uh, you know the New Times for $1,500 because I guarantee you that never happens. Yeah, the $1,500 becomes $2,500 or maybe $3,500. And yeah. you know, you're never confident in the end because you're not sure they did a good job because it was so shady in the first place. Yeah, exactly. But I like you, Dave. I, I guess I like you, but like you were saying, <laughs> pull that engine out and, ha- and and go to a shop that will send that out to a machine shop that will rebuild the engine and do all those components. And when you put that back in, it's like new. They're going to put on new motor mounts, new water pumps, new gaskets. Have you know everything is sealed, and you'd never have to mess with it again. That's a fantastic question, Steve. And again, bumper to bumper radio.com. Joel from Arizona Imports would be a good guy to at least consult with. When we come back, we're taking more calls at 602 277 5827. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, oh. welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio. Matt's trying to steal my thunder. And uh, we are talking about intermittent issues with vehicles and how frustrating they can be. And uh, if you guys got any car questions, doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be intermittent. It can just be a problem that, uh, you know, happens all the time. Give us a call, 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. And that last phone call on that engine question, I think it was Steve. Uh, you know, I don't know if we quite answered his question, but that is almost a whole show topic. You know, do we rebuild the engine? Do we remanufacture the engine? Do we recondition the engine? Do we go ahead and do a timing chain, an oil pan gasket? 
there's so much to that. It's hard to digest coming up on break like that. So you you can follow it up at bumper to bumper radio.com. I'd like to get you some more information. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot that goes into that. He mentioned valves, that there's a particular problem with the valves, but the car isn't. I guess it all depends on why we're suggesting that this needs might need to be rebuilt, but it's not uncommon for those Nissan timing chain guides to go bad and and cause some rattling. If then the guy starts talking about a valve job in the context of the, of rebuilding or remanufacturing the engine, that's one thing. But if it's just got a noisy timing chain, you're taking the oil pan off to do that job. That's going to get resealed. So you spend 1500 bucks maybe doing the timing chain and water pump, throw a couple of radiator hoses on it while you've got it apart, and maybe it doesn't even need to be remanufactured. Maybe start off with some uh, little blood work, oil sample. Yeah, oil sample's a great idea. Get an oil sample, a le- cylinder leak down test and compression test. And then maybe it's just you do a timing chain or you say, heck with it. I'm going to keep this thing a long time. I'm going to go another quarter man, quarter million. We are going to properly rebuild this engine, not just some guy slamming rings in it. You know, Right. In the old backyard Farmer John type rebuild. Yeah. I've done one of those once or twice. <laughs> Let's go with Jean in AJ. Looks like she's got a 2008 uh, Cadillac Escalade. Go ahead, Jean. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. You bet. I have a problem with my Escalade. I bought my Escalade used, and I've had it for about two years now. And the sensors on the tires uh, keep on coming on and off. And it doesn't matter if I'm on on a long trip or a short trip. They just come on and off, and it's never the same one. So So you'll get little air messages that says your tire is low. It's down to 25 pounds? Well, it'll tell me... it, it comes on and it, you know, I'll, I'll click on uh, which tire it is, and it'll, it'll not show that tire. Well, we're okay. about, we're about five years old on that Cadillac, and uh, when, when tire pressure monitoring systems first came around, I think we were what, 2005? That well, right? they were mandatory in 2007, and but they've been around prior to that. But probably what's happening on that car, Dave. We're expecting that around seven years old is when we're going to start seeing these. And those there's pressure sensors in there inside the wheel on most cars. Some cars, they use the brake, the speed sensor, the, the same sensor that you're using for analog brakes, and they report back rolling radius, and they're looking for a difference. But specifically on this Escalade, there's part of the valve stem, there's a sensor inside the wheel, and it's got a battery built into that sensor. It then sends a radio frequency to the controller inside the car. And that's getting lost. They're losing communication between the two of those. And probably what's happening is the sensor batteries are just dead. Yeah, it's and, just time to it's not a good not a good signal for it to pick up on. No, so you need to replace probably need to replace the sensors. Uh a, a shop that has the the right equipment, a tire shop typically could do that. Uh any most shops that are working on General Motors cars, it's not a big deal. Well, we, you, you, we get new sensors. You may consider that, hey, you know, the tires, you know, I probably don't need tires for another 5,000 miles. I'm going to hold off for 5,000 miles, even though that is a safety feature to, to know what your tire pressures True. are. So you're kind of not having that safety feature, but, you you know, you could do it at that time when you go buy that set of tires. You could take advantage, yeah, take advantage of saving the labor because what's going to have to happen is someone's going to have to pull the tires off the car, break the tires down at least halfway off, replay, put a new sensor, put a new stem, Sometimes they're aluminum, sometimes they're rubber, however they're mounted. There's different variations. Remount, rebalance the tires. Somebody might use a little arrow and put a piece of chalk on the wheel and a piece of chalk on the on the uh, tire and line it up. That's I wouldn't recommend doing that. And uh, then you've got to reprogram. Pretty simple on the – simple not meaning easy. Simple when compared to some of the other ones that we've done, the Cadillacs or a piece of cake or the GM products. For sure. Not a big deal, though. Well, thanks so much for the call, Gene. We're going to go with Brenda in Phoenix on a 2002 Mitsubishi Diamante. Go ahead, Brenda. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my call. My car runs beautifully, uh, and I'm going down the road, no problem. And I turn on the air conditioner. And I come to a stop at a red light or something, and the car stalls, goes completely dead. And I was wondering what might be causing that. When when it dies on you, is there any screeching or any other noises involved? Or it's simply just, does it shut clean off like it just comes to an abrupt start? Or is it just kind of, <laughs> and then shut off? <laughs> it just shuts off. Okay. Does it happen at really every stoplight? Yep. 
And it just recently started. I had the car checked fully this week at that AAA. They did the 36-point inspection. Mm-hmm. It showed no problems. And then all of a sudden, this started. And it only happens when the air conditioner is off. I come to a red light and I turn the air conditioner off, the car keeps running. But if I turn the air conditioner on, it goes dead. Okay. Well, you know, there's the difference between a 36-point check that and, a, and a diagnosis, two different things. At a chain shop where where they're going to – you went in for an oil change. They did this complimentary check, this uh, – inspection they didn't diagnose or look at why your car was stalling maybe they looked and didn't see anything obvious but when you go to a shop like that and they're doing that oil change they're looking at the other safety items the there's 36 points i don't know how you come up with those maybe the maybe the checking the brakes is four of those points i don't know well each tire four tires yeah so maybe that's 12 that's eight i don't Check know the my inside math. pad and the outside pad that's eight who knows what 36 <laughs> means but they're but they're doing checking the transmission fluid, checking the coolant. They're going to check your fluid levels. A thirty six point checkout doesn't mean everything's okay with the car and there's nothing wrong. That's just the things that they happen to check with an oil change. So probably what you need to find is a shop that can go in there and has the right tools and the right technicians to go in and do some testing and come up with a conclusion as to what's causing the problem. Well, I'm looking at the the issue. She said when the air conditions on it stalls, when the air conditions off it doesn't stall. And I say, what are the differences to the engine if the air conditions on? If the air conditions on, the compressor is running putting a load on the engine. And most vehicles, they have the computer compensates for the extra load by increasing the idle speed. So is that happening when the air conditions on? So it might be an idle speed issue, you know, when the car's coming up to a stop. Yeah, it's clogged up or dirty, carboned up throttle body vacuum hose off in that idle speed circuit uh, solenoid it, it, the engine's probably being loaded down it just can't handle it it needs some rpm so maybe try giving your foot just a little bit of gas on the stop on on the on on the accelerator when you come to that light maybe hold it up around a thousand rpm see if the engine continues to run and that will be good information for the shop to then go in and do some 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 real testing is what you're going to do and, and, and pay, probably pay somebody to do it. Well, Brenda, I see you're in Phoenix. You happen to be in central Phoenix. I'm going to tell Matt. Go ahead and see Matt at Virginia Auto Service. They can certainly handle that for sure. So we appreciate the call. We are going to go with a Maureen in Phoenix on a 2005 Mercury Montero. Go ahead, Maureen. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi. I'm having an intermittent problem that just started, say, oh, a couple weeks ago where – Upon acceleration, I'm having this almost like a stutter or a sluggishness, uh, and it happens going up hills, and sometimes it happens first thing in the morning when I'm taking the car out. Um, I'm not exactly sure, and I'm also hearing some knocking sounds. Do you have any check engine lights on? Yes. Okay. Well, anytime I think of the word stutter and sluggish, I think that the motor is misfiring possibly okay. a little stutter and misfire go hand in hand for me so and especially going up inclines you know if the mm-hmm. engine's running a little bit rough or not quite right uh mm-hmm. you know stuttering as soon as you go up a hill it's going to be worse or um it's going to bring it out more so you're taxing okay. the engine does that check engine light flash by chance have you ever noticed no, it flashing i haven't noticed it flashing uh no just it gives the check engine and then i have like a diagnostic on here but it doesn't tell me any uh, any particular problem, probably because there isn't. Now, when you say you have a diagnostic on there, what do, what do you mean you have a diagnostic? Uh, well, say if the tire pressure is low, it'll say check tires. Okay. If oil is low, it'll say check your oil, that kind of thing. Okay, so that that does the basic stuff. And you said right. it's intermittent. When the Is the check engine light always on? And so you're driving around, the check engine light's going to be on all day today, but you only have that problem at certain points in the day? Or does the check engine light only come on when you, while you're having the problem? The check engine light is on all the time. The problem only happens sometimes during the day, but it has been daily, I will, I will say that, uh, where I've felt this stuttering um, but yeah, the check engine light just remains on. Okay. Well, the first thing that we're going to want to do, if you came into my shop and you were across the counter from me and you're talking with Tim or Robert or myself about the car, we're going to talk, we're going to have this conversation at the counter and we're typing all this stuff in so that the technician that gets the car understands it in your words. We're not going to rephrase this. 
in our words and steer them or, or let them know what we think the problem is because oftentimes what we think at the counter really doesn't matter. We can go down the wrong road. And then the technician is going to want to start with the check engine light. Why is this check engine light on? That could be on for a number of different reasons. It might not even be related to your problem. But the integrity of the engine control system has to be in place first, especially if it's a related issue, if it's a misfire problem or or a, who knows what it might be, lean fuel condition. We need to get that part straightened away first, more likely. And that very well could solve your problem. You know, in most of these questions on the air, we're limited as far as how many questions that we can ask. But you ask more questions here, Matt. And when it's an intermittent issue, don't get offended by the 20 questions at the counter. That guy is looking for for answers. And you don't need to steer him. Just answer what he asked. And it's not going to be semantics. It just the way it is. And that's really going to help them get to the right answer to know which direction to look. In most shops charge diagnostic and they charge diagnostic, there, there's a calculation back there for how much time and how much money it costs. So the better your information, the cheaper the diagnostic. So that's one way to save money. Yeah, definitely. It's a good way to save money. It's time for Fact or Fiction. Man, I pulled that thing out. That thing hasn't been around in a year. But uh, I figured it was time, and the fact and the fiction for the day comes from an email I got. And this email I see a lot of times is that someone plugged in, I got a printout, and it they, they, that diagnosed my car. How much should that cost? And, you know, fact or fiction, this is my fact or fiction that I invented out of this email, is can you plug into a car, and the car just gives you the answer, tells you exactly what's wrong. Fact or fiction. Uh, that'd be a big fat fiction there, Dave. Big fat <laughs> fiction. Okay. Well, uh, the, the question at the counter a lot of times it's we're talking about these intermittent problems, and we happen to have these these check engine light issues today, and we're we're talking about, and people think the computer, the computer knows, tells you everything. So you just <laughs> I got you rolling your eyes and say it tells you everything. So there's this this. Misnomer, misconception, misconception for sure. that you plug in the computer, and then it says, "Hey, Matt, uh, nice to see you today." Uh, <laughs> it's you actually print- the ground wire on top of the gas tank behind the left rear tire. It doesn't tell you that. I wish it did. Well, no, actually, I didn't because I'd be out of a job. <laughs> right. It it gives us information to go to the area. It's going to give us a fault code, but it it's it's not necessarily the you, you have an oxygen sensor code. It's not, don't kill the messenger always. You have to go in and do the testing. It no more tells you what the problem is with the car than, than the X-ray, than the camera at the X-ray center, at the imaging center, tells you which bone is broken in your hand or what's wrong with your, the, you know, the, what do you call it? The ultrasound doesn't tell you what sex the baby is. Somebody still has to look at that and understand what they're seeing. Well, it looks like we can slide one more in at 602-277-5827, and we'll finish up this diagnostic conversation. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we are answering your questions every Saturday from 11 to noon. It sounds like we got next weekend off, Matt. I guess it's time for me to catch up on a little bit of yard work. That's the one thing I like about football season is we get a Saturday off because I don't care about football. My, my wife started to get a list that. of honeydews as soon as she knew I was off next Saturday. Ooh, the honeydews slid in. I think I'm going to do my annual oleander trim and that is a I don't, all I don't envy day you at all. Deal. That get is up. totally miserable. Ugh. And okay. all the leaves in between, and I'm like obsessive compulsive, and I got helpers there, and I'm like, just no, no, a no, little no, more, more, more. <laughs> We're done. No, you're not done. If you go, go, right. go get more, please. It's so. uh, my kids hate helping. I know Ludwig's like, oh, not the Oleanders, uh, not that time of year. We're gonna go with Ed in Whitman. He's got a tire pressure question on a General Motors product. Go ahead, Ed. You're on bumper to bumper radio. Yeah, I uh, we had something similar that was going on with uh, our sensors on the tire pressures. And when we took it in, what we were told was that at one point in time, or maybe even a couple of points in time, the um, tires had been rotated into different areas, like when we bought tires at the shop, and it hadn't been reprogrammed to let the computer know where the sensor place was for that particular tire. And uh, that kind of sounded like it could have been what that lady was having also with the Escalade, that somebody had moved the tires and the sensor was programmed because she said she was having like a low tire and that the computer was telling her that it 
was one tire on, uh, say, the left rear, but it was actually the left front. Right, slow. right. Well, I, and that happens more often than not, and that's what, you know, there's not just, uh, you know, people want to dumb down auto repairs, just not unbolting and bolting the tires back on. I took it as that it just loses the pressure. It doesn't communicate at all. I didn't hear that there was the right front was flat, but it was really the left rear. But again, that's one of those deals. The computer doesn't know anything. It only knows what you tell it, garbage in, garbage out. If you go rotate the tires all around, it's not watching. It doesn't have this camera that says, hey, look at this. They just rotated the tires. And now the left front's over on the left rear. So when you do a rotation on a car that has tire pressure monitoring sensors, the actual sensor in the wheel, or you know, mounted inside the wheel, you've got to then go tell the computer where those sensors are, and there's a relearn procedure that that has to be done. You know, on the GM cars, you cycle the key two or three times, um, do something, then the horn will honk, and then you go. You have to change the pressure, so you go let a little bit of air out of the left front tire. The horn goes ah, uh, okay. Now you know the computer. We've started this process with the left front. Now you're going to go let some air out of the right front tire because it knows the sequence. I'm so glad I'm in the transmission business. Woo! Stand yeah. on your head, scratch your yeah. I mean, Sim- <laughs> simple rotation, you know, uh, in and out in 30 minutes, and you're quickie luby. Um, no, it's Done not deal. It's... not how it goes down anymore. It, it's it's definitely more complicated, and and you've got to find the right shop that can handle all these problems and these situations for you. Thanks so much for the call, Ed. We're going to go with Mike in Mesa on a 1999 Ford Expedition. Go ahead, Mike. You're on Bumper to Bumper guys. Radio. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Uh, real quickly, I just wanted to say thank you. I used Accurate uh, Automotive, uh, one of your suggested shops, uh, just the other day. They did a phenomenal job. Oh, that's great. And also, the, my question, I have a 99 uh, Expedition. I took it in for an oil change, and, uh, of course, they called me over and had it up and told me I needed ball joints, and they had me shake the front tires each side. One did not shake. The other one, I just shook just slightly, maybe uh, just a little bit of play, half inch. And then they, you know, they gave me a price, and uh, I passed on it, but I parked it. Um, How important is that? Well, you know, if you go out and get in an accident tomorrow because the ball joint broke, uh, the attorney for the other party that you ran into is probably going to really make it really important. Uh, we would have to see the car, so that would probably be a question back to Lee. I mean, Dave, how when do you see ball joints actually come out? It's not that bad, but you said a half an inch. That's a pretty good amount That's of movement. That's big time. I, w- I, I would wonder if it's really a, a half an inch. Um, so it, it depends on the condition. I don't think that's an answer that we can really uh, a question that we can really answer. A little bit of play versus a lot of play. There, we've seen ball joints where we've actually said, "No, you're towing the car here. Sign this work order like seven times. Uh, you, you you shouldn't be driving this car. Or let me know where you're going to be driving because I don't want to be on the road anywhere <laughs> near you." But but then we've also seen just a little bit of play, and it comes from a you know you typically see that your chain type of plays oh no yeah. this is yeah, there's a little bit of play i would you know take that in there have lee look at that with you and just see how much movement is actually there and just and that's well, where the relationship well comes they looked in. at it together so now right. i think the question is really uh, yeah what, what, is this thing really going to fall apart on me or am i okay around town in ball but, joints are expensive repair you know for sure well you've got one i mean you've got four so sometimes the ball joint comes with the control arm maybe it doesn't maybe you can buy the control arm and it comes with the ball joint, and it's a little bit more money, but then it comes with the control arm bushings. Putting the ball joint in the old control arm is maybe $50 less, but it's $90 or $80 to put the bushings in. Is the upper one bad? Should we just do all four of them at a time? You were about to go back to the relationship, Dave. It's worth having that relationship. Well, sus- suspension components especially. You know, how much is too much play in, a, in an idler arm, pitman arm? I mean, when, when when does it become a problem? When are those ball joints moving too much? When are those tie rod ends moving too much? You go to an alignment shop, and they may put it on the alignment rack and say, wow, you know, we can't even align your car because we got so much play in your tie rod ends. You know, when is too much too much? Well, and you've got, you know, it's the hip bone connected to the elbow bone through whatever other bones and bones. I mean, a little bit of play in the ball joint, a little bit of play in the pitman arm, a little bit of play in the idle arm, tie rod ends worn out a little bit. Pretty soon this thing is, is you know. 
Well, Spot is whatever. The other thing we talk about is, you know, the sh- we've talked about shop hopping, shop to shop to shop. And when you stick with one shop, and a guy can just monitor stuff like that for you. You know what? We don't need to do anything about it today. Let's address that down the road. I mean, it's not, you know, today's business. Let's keep our eye on it. So anyway, we're glad you could join us. If you're looking for a great shop, bumper to bumperradio.com. While you're there, there's a Facebook link, bottom left. Be sure to like Matt and I. We, we would appreciate that. We're Cheyenne friends still. <laughs> so thanks, Peter, for running the dials. Like I said, next week we'll be off, but the following week we're going to have the guys from Mesa Auto Works going to come in and join us. And Stan is the, the Volvo guru of all time, I think, one of the one of the two Volvo shops on the bumper-to-bumper list, actually. And so if you got an older Volvo or we're be dialed in for those kind of questions. And I think one of the topics I want to address is the second repair at the auto shop. We'll see you in a couple weeks.